You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I am your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a good one. Our guest is the founder and chairman of TOA Global, which is a professional accounting outsourcing partner that helps build and grow offshore teams. Nick Sinclair, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. Really excited to be on the show. That's great to have you, and I'm looking forward to learning more about you and also how you're helping a lot of bookkeepers and accountants right around the globe. And before we get into that, please tell us your career journey leading up to this point. Yeah, it's been an interesting ride, might be to say. Um, might be the easiest way to say it. So growing up, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I thought I wanted to be an environmental scientist, so I started studying that and then Pivoted, um, got into the financial services world, worked at banks for a while, um, and then I fell into financial planning, um, which was really my passion for, for about 12 years. And um, at the age of 21, I was a young, um, not not a millennial, but I had this simple attitude where I didn't want to work for my employer. So I went and set up my own financial planning business, and I built and grew that over 12 years. And as the journey went on, I, I built in a, a finance business as part of that, a property buyer's agent business. Um, and then the last aspect of it, which I had for about four years before I ended up merging the whole business and exiting, um, was an accounting practice. So we were an early adopter um, of zero. So I bought an accounting firm, converted the whole firm to be a zero-based business. Um, this is when cloud was early days in Australia. So we had 100% zero practice for a platinum partner um, and I ran that business for about 12 years before merging it and then exiting out of it. But the merge and exit really was driven by TOA, what is now TOA Global, it wasn't meant to be a business, it just happened by default. So I had a team of 38 staff in Australia and we were struggling day to day with keeping up with capacity. We were struggling with having the right people doing the right type of work. And I was over in the Philippines for a board meeting as part of a group called Entrepreneurs Organization, which is now 20 plus thousand members around the world, actually originated um, by Vern Harnish in the US. But great organization. I was in the Philippines for a board meeting with that. And one of our members from Australia was lived in Manila and he invited me and a few others to go um, and catch up with him. So I went and caught up with him. I'd never met him before. He had the largest removalist company in Australia. So they moved people for when you wanted to move from one house to another. They were the company that you rang typically. And I went in to um, meet him and then I saw his office and he had a significant back office and he had a team, you know, generating leads for him. They were generating 3,000 leads a day. They had call center, they had accounting, they had all these different functions. And and I looked at it and went, how can I actually do that for my business? How can I become more efficient and add more services? And offshoring wasn't really a thing in the industry at that time. So I ended up putting on a team for myself. Again, being, I call it young and naive at the time. Um, I had 38 staff in Australia, so I put on 30 staff in the Philippines. I didn't do things in halves. And got my back office up and running. And then about four months later, a, a friend who sits on the board or who was the president of LEO board, Rob Nixon, who's quite well known in the industry, asked me to come on a speaking tour around Australia New Zealand with him across 13 cities. And I knew I'd learned something from him. So I said, yep, I'll, I'll jump on the tour with you and I'll talk about what I'm doing with your clients and, and people that I suppose he educates. And it, after the first, event, I had five accounting firms come up to me saying, Nick, we, we love the concept of what you're doing with, you know, building capacity, getting the right people to do the right work. Can we put some people in your office? Do you have any spare desks? Because we don't want to have to go and set up like you have. 
I call it entrepreneurial. Um, sometimes I think about it as stupidity. I, I basically said yes. Because at the time I had 20 spare desks in my office, I had a 50 seat office, I had 20 spare desks and I, I thought, well, if I can sell those, you know, half of those desks while I'm on this roadshow with Rob, that'll pay for the office running costs. So that my only cost then for my firm is the actual people that I employ, the 30 people that were doing the work for my firm. The problem was after the three week tour, I had sold 90 seats and it became a business and Overnight, then it turned into 210, then it was 420, um, and it's continued to double in size every year. At the end of this year, we'll end up around 1,500 staff um, and doubling every year. So it's turned into a, a real business, which a couple of years ago, I decided to exit and merge out of my my original passion, which was my financial planning and accounting business, to um, now work and run full-time the yeah, outsourced accounting or TOA Global. That's an incredible story. What a what a journey and what an incredibly large organization that you run. It is. It's uh, it's interesting though, and I've got two perspectives on this, is that in Australia, it's a very, like it is a large business, but in the Philippines, we're only a very small provider. I mean, there's others that recruit a thousand people a week. So when you put it into perspective, I mean, we are the second largest employer of accountants in the Philippines now, and at some point in the next few years, we'll be the largest. But as an employer in the Philippines, we're, we are still one of the small ones. Wow. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it's incredible. You've, you, your learnings must have been, I mean, <laughs> it's just compounding effect of learnings to deal with a, y- a young start and then growing and having staff. When looking back at that, in terms of adding staff and having staff, what were some of the big mistakes you made along the way and then recouped and, and, and changed after, after learning them? That's a really interesting question because, I mean, I didn't know what I didn't know. And even to a point now, you know, we're 1,500 staff. Next year, we're going to go to you know, close to 2,500. And, and it's not something that I'd... I've done before. There's plenty of things that I learned along the way. A lot of it was around, I mean, the big one is is when you, you grow that quick, you outgrow some of your team members. Your team members' growth can't keep up with the company growth in some cases. And I think at times that we outgrew staff members, but we kept people in roles where they weren't skilled or competent anymore because, you know, we might have been 90 staff, but now we're 400 staff. And the thing that I that I always tried to do is is to grow the team members and give them the opportunity to be in that role instead of going, you know what, they're very strong at this level, and over the next three years we're going to go to a thousand people. Their their career is going to continue to grow, but just because they came in as the most senior person, it doesn't mean in twelve months they have to be the most senior. We can bring people in above them if the company is growing at a quicker rate than their skill set is to keep up. Because I think what happens otherwise, and this has certainly happened, is that we had someone that was really good. We tried to keep their growth so that they were the most senior person, but at a point they're not competent in that role, which means that they can't be in that role and you have to replace them. So it's really about getting the right people in the right seat and growing them to as fast as they can, but it doesn't have to keep up with the growth of the company. And I think sometimes that's hard because when someone's employed and they're the most senior person in their area and then you bring in people above them, you need to manage that effectively. But I learned a lot around that side of it on the journey. Yeah, I can imagine. And difficult, right? These are, these are people and, and, and whilst it's challenging, it's, it's the best for everyone likely in order to be successful, for them to be successful and for the organization to be successful, change has to happen. Yeah, definitely. So now this is an offshore team. Let's talk about that. You you have clients in the United States, Canada, Australia, right around the world. And why are people coming to you for the service? And I think it relates back to exactly why I started to build this business for my own business. So originally my own accounting and financial planning firm was is that it's, it's tough to find staff. But you also want to progress staff and give them meaningful work. 
And I think the challenge is, is that particularly during, you know, our busy series, seasons of tax and that is that everyone's just buried in work. And I think the the reality is, is, is being able to build a global team means you're getting the right people doing the right work at the right cost, which builds capacity so that you can actually deliver more services to our clients. And, and I think a lot of times... Our industry, in a lot of cases, forgets who we're here to serve, and we're here to serve small business. We're here to make a difference in the community that we operate. But a lot of the time, we don't have the capacity to do that. And I think the flip side of that is is that the traditional way of bringing an employee in where they will you know, take eight or nine years to get up to a manager or partner level is not up to date with where the current workforce is. People don't want to come in and do... You know, I remember I started in my role, although I wasn't in it for long, I came in, I collected the mail and did, you know, made tea and coffee for the partners. And, you know, my map of my career with them was going to be eight years. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm not doing this, which is one of the reasons why when I started out performing some of the partners from a revenue point of view after a couple of months, I said, hang on, I'm setting up my own. So I think that you know, the, the employment market is changing. I think the other part of it is, is that, and every accountant I talk to globally about this, struggles to find great staff. Then they may attract someone, but how are they going to keep them? And it's really around getting them to do meaningful work that they enjoy and they're passionate about and not having to do the mundane process oriented work that you know, technology can automate some of it, but there's always going to be an element of it that needs someone driving that side of it. It makes a lot of sense. And and you, in terms of the, the, the people that you have coming on board with you, let's maybe talk a little bit about that. What is a typical scenario you meet uh, a person who wants to increase capacity? And this is a really key thing. Now it's probably always been, but more and more as there's so many people that need the services of our listeners and difficult to hire and find talented and good staff, that the capacity is key in order to to work on the important pieces in your business if you don't have that capacity. So one of the ways to do that is to hire, hire staff. And so maybe walk us through a journey of what that would look like for somebody to take this journey with TOA. Well, I think the first step is really working out what's your people strategy for the next two to three years. And this is something I think a lot of businesses struggle with is to work out how much capacity they need. Normally, they look at the top line revenue and they don't always relate it back to say, all right, well, if we need this much revenue, it means this many hours of work, which means we need this many people. And if we grow at a faster rate than that, then we need to employ and keep up with that. So the first part is really identifying, I suppose, the people strategy within the existing business. If they have staff locally already, what type of work are they doing that we can take from them and put with a new global team? And then what work will they be doing and driving locally? So it's really about identifying the tasks that are going to be there. And I think this is something that's different. Our, our model is we provide full-time dedicated staff to accounting and bookkeeping firms. So that doesn't necessarily have to mean a bookkeeper or an accountant. It could be that if it's a small bookkeeping business where there's only one or two staff, it could be that the owner needs a VA, someone to manage their emails, someone to manage their calendar, someone to manage their world so that they're as effective as they can. And that's the first employee they put on. We work right up to second tier firms. So large firms, then it's very much different the types of roles that they need. But the first part is identifying what are the roles that you need and then the second one is is the way to look at it is, and this is the slight difference is, we don't typically look at when you're putting a team in, in, in the Philippines or a global team together, it's not typically looking at a role as you would when you're employing locally. What we typically do is look at the workflow and your process and say what elements of that can be done by a global team. So it may be all of the reconciliations, it may be all the you know, checking and auditing that if you're using Receipt Bank or HubDoc or Auto Entry or one of those systems, you know, the coding's been done right. What element of the process are they going to do versus in like in Australia, for example, when I had my accounting firm, we got them to do from the start of the tax return to the end of the tax return. But then when we started to build our offshore team, we went, all right, well, they do 
first five steps in the process because that work should be done by a global team. Then steps, you know, five onwards should be done by someone locally because that needs a higher level of knowledge. So it's really identifying what is the the process and work that they're going to be doing and then it's around recruiting for those needs and then building and training for that. So it, it varies but it all leads with that people strategy. How many people do we need for the capacity that we currently have and we're predicting to have with the revenue targets that we're chasing? I think that's the missing link with a lot of bookkeeping and accounting firms is they never work out how much capacity they need. They work out their top line revenue, but that's as far as it goes. Makes it, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I mean, I think it's a, a great exercise even just to think about what is the plan for the future? What are the staffing needs going to be? And I, I can see right away, every business is at a different stage, has different needs. It sounds like you have pieces that en- enable them to maybe walk before they run, but to give, to give them some capacity even do, to start do some of that deeper planning. Yeah, definitely. And I think it all comes back to getting the right people to do the right work at the right cost. And I was speaking with one of our clients in Australia yesterday and I said to him, I said, what's the biggest benefit you've got? Because he's he was a sole practitioner um, when he first, he, he was in a large firm, he left the firm, went out on his own and he was back by himself. I said, what was the real benefit that having a global team gave you? And he said, the reality is I couldn't afford to employ a senior manager in Australia right at the start. As soon as I went out, I broke away from the partnership, he said, but I employed a global team with you. I could I could afford to put on two people as part of my global team at Tower. And that allowed me to get the work flowing through and the revenue flowing through. And then once that happened, I was able to employ someone locally. And employing them was a lot easier because they didn't have to do that process orientated work. I could give them more meaningful work and He employed a graduate and instead of it taking, you know, three years to get to a manager level or five years, he's been able to spend a lot more time with them and get them to a really high level after about 18 months. So they're doing a lot more meaningful work. So it's really around, you know, how can you grow a business with the, you know, with revenue you've got, but normally the revenue doesn't match the capacity. We always need to hire you know, that person now that we need in six months time, but our revenue may not be at that level. So it's a great way to cost effectively be able to do that and and really ensure that everyone's doing meaningful and enjoyable work to a degree. It's it's fantastic story. And it has me think about just some of the, the, the mistakes you see some of these business owners making when they come to you and if any come to mind. But I, I would imagine that, they they have a certain view of what's possible, just like this 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 person from Australia. You know, it's going to cost X to hire a staff member at that level, and it's just not possible. So they 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 shut down really the thinking that thinking. So something like this can o- almost open up a person's mind in terms of like what's possible. I mean, it, it really like when you said the number of staff that you have, you know. Most of our listeners, you know, we're talking one or two staff, maybe more, but we're talking, it's small business, right? And, and you're running an organization that's a, if compared to these small businesses, is massive. And so it's almost like a, whoa, that's a lot of people, a lot of people to keep track of. But if you have a solution that enables our listener to think bigger and to th- think what's possible, the demand for the services that we're talking about is incredible. And it's not going to get any smaller. It's only going to get greater in that there's business owners out there that need the services of great bookkeepers and great accountants. And so how do you keep up with that? So you're, you're offering an interesting solution to this. But what, what other mistakes have you seen owners making as they're trying to scale and grow their businesses? I think, in, particularly in the accounting um, and bookkeeping space, I think the biggest challenge that, that I see is that firms think that technology is going to solve all their problems. They think that, you know, and I think the industry the, the industry is, is being sold to quite well in that they believe the all the talk around automation and, and all of these wonderful things. And I think we need to remember is that we're in a people service business. That's never going to change. Technology is a great tool and a great enabler for us to deliver better services quicker, you know, at a more rapid rate. But 
at the end of the day, technology is just a tool. We're always going to be required and the service that we deliver is going to evolve and change as technology does. But I think firms really struggle with a lot of the time, I call it PPT, people process technology. And that process and technology is the part where they really struggle. And I think it's the time where they probably spend the least amount of time. They, They see this wonderful software, they may buy it, but they don't fully implement it. When you don't fully implement it, you don't get the full benefit of the tool. So it ends up causing more time to actually do the work as opposed to less or they use their old processing new technology or they have a, you know a senior person or the, if it's only a small practice for example where there's only a couple of staff you see the owner spending all their time trying to implement this technology when you can get someone in the philippines for example at you know six to nine dollars an hour to do all the heavy lifting so that you know once the tech is set, they can drive it and they can get it set up while you focus on your clients. And I think I always link it back to how do we better serve our clients and, you know, evolving technology and and things like that enable us to actually better serve our clients. But in a lot of cases, what I see is it removes us away from the clients as opposed to bringing us closer to the client. I, I agree. And it speaks to when you handle it, the ability to actually start delivering more valuable outcomes for clients. And so I really like the story. I like the the way where your business is going and the growth is incredible. You started in Australia, but how long have you been operating in in the U.S. and also Canada? Yeah, so we've had clients in the U.S. for three years. We've had a physical office there for a bit over 12 months. In the US, that is. And in Canada, we've had clients. Our first client came on about 18 months ago now. And we've got a physical office actually getting opened in Toronto in February 2020. So the growth in the in US and Canada is picking up speed every day. So we've got a team in San Diego at the moment and soon to be a team in Toronto. Excellent. And you know, I guess along my journeys and talking to people about offshoring, some of the, the the concerns that people would bring up, and I'm curious to hear what you would say about it, is this whole concept of where data is. I mean, Canada has certain laws around where data is ho- housed and stored and moved and all that good stuff. In the United States, I'm sure there are many like that. You would be probably up to date on those. How, how do you handle those kind of concerns that people have? You know, I mean, security is definitely a, a critical issue for businesses and, you know, we have the same laws in Australia when I had my accounting firm. So I think the enabler, and this is really the thing that made it more mainstream, and it certainly is in, in the Australian accounting space. If you, like I talk at an event, I ask who's not outsourcing these days as opposed to who is. But when I speak in Canada or, or America, it's still very much, you know, is anyone outsourcing? Has anyone got a global team? The benefit is, is because of cloud technology is that these systems are typically housed in the cloud, which means anyone can access it from anywhere. So the, the data is typically stored in the country. I mean, in Zero, for example, they have servers all around the world where the server may be centralised in North America, but then it will back up in Singapore or, or in other locations. The same with, you know, intro, all of the, all of the large practices do that, all the large software companies. So the benefit of the cloud is, is that there is no actual data being sent across to the Philippines team. Everything is cloud based and, and even businesses that are not in the cloud at the moment, they're typically running on a server and all we do is have the team in the Philippines remote desktop in. So they remotely dial into the server, um, and access the information that way. So. Outsourcing used to be in the past, you'd send all of the documents physically over email or through a portal to the provider and they would keep it on their servers. We don't even have servers within our office. Our team members work directly for their client. Whatever system and tools that their client uses, they use. In a lot of cases, they dial into the server or they'll have cloud-based applications that they access. So... Once people understand that they're just another team member of yours, they just happen to be sitting in the Philippines, then it becomes, I suppose, a lot easier to understand um, in that aspect. 
I think it's, it's a great way that you answered it. And it has, it just, I mean, it has my mind kind of <laughs> thinking like even the, the conversation, when you really think about it, it's like some of these regulations are, are put in place with thinking that was a year, two, three, ten years back. And the, the rapid change in technology, it almost makes them obsolete. I mean, how do you contain or protect or put a wall around anything when it comes to the internet, really? But it makes a lot of sense. Cloud tools have enabled that that ability for people to work on something right around the world. You know, it's only a matter of time before these servers are maybe located on the moon. Uh, who knows, right? But that's a refreshing, a refreshing angle. I think the point of that too, Michael, is if I can add in, is that remote working is becoming more and more relevant. And so too is having a distributed team. It doesn't necessarily have to be a team in the office where you are based anymore. You could have a team member working for you on the opposite side of Canada if you're based in Toronto, for example, could be in Vancouver. Um, Or you could even have someone working in America for you or Australia. I had a client a couple of weeks ago in Australia that one of their team members was moving to Europe. And I said, oh, you know, and she was a great team member. I said, oh, you must be, you know, sad that you're losing her. And they said, what do you mean, Nick? She's just moving to Europe. She's still part of our team. She's just going to be working those hours. We've got a team in Australia and we've got a team with you. So we're, we've now got a global team, but they're all serving our clients in Australia. It is incredible, really, when you think about it. And so with these new ways of life and, and work comes the, just a different way of thinking, I, I would think, and also a different way of working, different skills needed, I think. I mean, I've grown Definitely. up, and just like you, I've grown up in a world where, you know, you you collaborate with people probably the best. I come from the generation where the best collaboration happens right in the same room. Uh, and so it, as remote working gets more and more prevalent, and I mean, it's it's everywhere. I mean, our think of our organization, there's very few that work in the same location. Everyone is scattered about uh, in different locations. And, and there's so many reasons to do that. Even if they're local people on your team, do they really want to spend 20 minutes, even a day driving? Why not just work from home and work from wherever you work best. There's so many benefits that come along with that, but there's also challenges, you know, communication and and making sure that things are getting done and tracking things. How does that look in your world? Look, it's probably the biggest thing that we didn't, when I first started to our global, it was the thing that I didn't think I'd have to educate people on, but I've, I've learned that a lot of people don't know how to set up communication rhythms and, and they don't communicate effectively within their businesses when everyone's in the one office. So when you start having a remote team, it's a big education journey. So a large part of what we do now is is educate our clients on how to communicate and manage a remote team because it's easy when someone's in the same office, even if you don't spend a lot of time communicating with them because you're you're busy working, you're still in the one environment and and communication flows a lot easier. So when you start building out a distributed team where you don't get to see them on a day-to-day basis, it's even in the morning, how do you connect with them and do a virtual hello versus, you know, when you walk into an office physically saying hello. So you've got to really spend a lot more time focusing on building the relationships and communication with those team members and a few of our clients are 100% remote businesses locally as well as having a global team with us. And they're probably the best clients because they already understand how hard it can be to manage a team remote because you still need those relationships. You need to build trust and rapport with your fellow co-workers to get the most out of them. You need to be able to understand are they having a good day or a bad day and how do you effectively help them to become more effective. So there is a lot more learning involved in managing a remote team. It sounds, and, and I've seen a lot more material and talk about, you know, remote teams and all this, and it makes it sound so wonderful and easy when the reality is it's actually a lot harder to run a remote practice. But if you implement the process and systems to do it, it becomes quite rewarding for everyone. It becomes a lot easier to recruit talent because it, you're no longer fixated on a set area. It can be where's the best talent in the country or globally. Absolutely. But yeah, there's a lot more work involved. A lot more work on the front end and, and change of behavior, change of thinking, but all incredibly powerful when you, you do you do make those changes and you do make the the the, the leap. Scaling is a whole nother conversation uh, and and a new a new 
exciting reality that's here to really leverage technology. And you mentioned systems and process as well. I would imagine that's huge for the, the, the growing pains of some of your clients is that they come into the situation where they don't even have a documented or, or known best practice or system or process that they've documented to for their own team. It's, you know, sort of teaching people how to do things. I mean, Michael Gerber, and we talk a lot about Emith, right? They're running people-driven business versus system-driven businesses. And so you try and have an offshore team it's like, you got to let them know how to do it. They got to, you know, it's like, if you want it done a certain way, you have to explain and, and make sure that, that they're trained to do it the way you want to do it. So I think a lot of people who've ever even hired local staff blame the staff versus blaming the systems in the business, which, which, is, which is common. Have you run up against that? And uh, what's that look like? Yeah, definitely. And and like I mentioned before, my um, PPT philosophy, you know, people process technology. I think our industry has been really great at being, you know, selling the technology part to practices and businesses. I think the people part is something that, you know, firms don't necessarily do great, but they need the people. So they, they find them and they put them in the seat, but they don't give them the process to enable the technology and the people to maximise the efficiency of both. And the other part is, so what we typically find with small, um, you know, accounting or bookkeeping practices is that it's all in the owner's head. So it's about getting that into documented systems and processes. So when you go to a large firm um, or people, you know, where there's more than one partner, the challenge is, is that each partner does it their own way. So there's no, we call it in TOA, the TOA way. There is only one way to recruit within our business. There is only one way to do each process. It's the TOA way. And that's one of the things that we really struggle with. I mean, that's how you and I first got connected in that, you know, a lot of accounting firms now are coming to us globally and saying, we want to set up a bookkeeping division. So can you give us the resources to do the processing work? And we've got one of our people locally that's going to move into the person that's running this division. And we always say, yes, yeah, certainly we can help you with that. But what's your process? And they turn around and say, well, this is the first time we've done it. Although we're accountants, we don't, under, you know, we don't necessarily know the process, which is how we got connected with you to, because to, you've got all of that. You've got that process part. Um, but that's where I think businesses in our industry really struggle the most. Is they don't spend time on the process because they're too busy doing the work and serving their clients that they don't realise, well, hang on, the better the process, the less time it's going to take to do a job. And the more effective we're going to be utilising technology and our people are going to be doing more meaningful work and be able to move through. And firms that have great process, it's easy. You can you can see that they can onboard and train a team, it doesn't matter where they are in the globe, really fast to ones that have poor process. It's a lot harder. They can still do it. They just need to invest a lot of time. But what we see is that a lot of our clients don't have the process part so their, their new global team that's based in the Philippines, when they start training them, that's when they start developing the process, the templates, and it's something that's built over time. It's a great investment of time. And it, just like with the technology, if you only implement a piece of the technology, you're only going to get a piece of the benefit. Same with when you're building systems and process. It has to be built. I mean, we help people with that. We build it for them, but you still have to implement it. So if you are building systems, you've got to you got to do it. You got to do it fully, and and then live by those systems. Otherwise, you get no benefit. Uh, but the people who keep at it, keep doing it, and make it a priority, and you know, scrape, you know, crawl whatever they need to do to get that piece of their business done, reap the rewards long-term. Business gets easier. It looks different. There's new problems, of course, but when you get those ones solved, business is a lot more uh, run smoothly and, and it's a whole, a whole new opportunity for them. So this has been super exciting. I've learned a ton and I'm sure our listener is excited to learn more about TOA and maybe how you might be able to help them in their business. Nick, what would be the best way for our listener to do that? Best way is to, to, to go to our website, toaglobal.com, or reach out to me. I'm on all the social medias, Nick Sinclair, or you can just email me at nick at toaglobal.com. Beautiful. And of course, we'll have all of those in the show notes. And Nick, on behalf of all of our listeners, I want to thank you for your generosity in coming on the show and sharing about your company and your learnings. And, and I know we'll likely hear more from you in the future. 
Thanks for giving me the opportunity to come and um, share my story with you, Michael. It's been our pleasure. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast to learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources. You can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Oh, and by the way, we love to hear your reviews. If you've heard something today that's been valuable, please let us know, put it onto iTunes or whatever podcast app you, you listen to, rate us and give us a recommendation. And if there's things you'd like to hear different, get in touch with us, let us know. And until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.